Hi, Brad. Thanks for joining us again. So, Brad Matthews from BMIS and Plain English Economics. Um, yeah, really appreciate your time again, Brad, to talk investments. Yeah, no, no problems, Pete. Yeah, so obviously things have been moving pretty quickly. Um, you know, we've got restrictions changing down in Melbourne. I know Sydney's sort of um, a little bit more relaxed up there. So, um, but globally, I think everyone's facing similar challenges. So, keen to get your insights again uh, and reflecting back like things are changing daily so we're recording this on the 13th of May but taking a look backwards at what's happened in April um, really importantly and then I guess how, to, how we're sort of thinking about portfolios moving forward as well so um, are you sort of are you thinking things are settling down at all Brad or is it sort of uh, still um, plenty of news flow for you to digest? Yeah, look, there's, there's certainly no shortage of things to, to talk about. Um, I, I wouldn't say things are settling down, but things are definitely definitely moving. Um, so we, we've certainly seen a big change in mood on markets uh, over, over recent weeks. Beautiful. All right, so we might sort of, we've prepared some slides here that we might sort of quickly talk to, but they're not sort of, there's not too many of them. So um, I guess the first one we'll get out of the way is a quick disclaimer so yeah this is general advice only so don't go and make any rash decisions off the back of this um, but really what were the key I guess items that you sort of saw throughout April uh, across investment markets Brad? Yeah look I guess the, uh, the the tone for markets in April were, were really set in in late March when we had um, the, the the huge amount of government stimulus announced in, in that final week of March uh, both locally and also um, in the US in particular. Uh, so that, that um, set in, in, in train, I guess, a, a recovery in sentiment, uh, which was reflected in improving equity market valuations, um, as well as a, 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 a very significant improvement in liquidity in, in uh, fixed interest markets in particular. Yeah, and that, yeah. is, it, is it still unprecedented? Like, is, when does it stop becoming unprecedented when we keep sort of seeing this... Uh, you know, massive sort of, oh, they're calling it stimulus, getting rolled out. Yeah, look, it, uh, it, it certainly is unprecedented when you look at um, the, the level of stimulus, uh, both in terms of monetary stimulus from central banks and also fiscal stimulus from, um, from governments. Um, relative to the size of the economy over time, we, ha we have had nothing like this in such a short space of time. Uh, so it's it, the, the word unprecedented is being used all the time, but it, it, it's actually a very accurate description of what we have seen. Um, I mean, central banks and governments can't continue to do this. It, it's not um, it's not a a, a repeatable process. Um, but yeah. we've seen that's thrown a lot um, at uh, at the economy over over recent weeks, and um, certainly in terms of the response of financial markets, it's had a positive effect. Yeah, it was, it was a very welcome shot in the arm because I think people were, that despondency and sort of fear was really kicking in um, before that. So uh, very, very well received, obviously, with sort of markets, you know, um, turning quite strongly. So we might sort of kick off and talk about, uh, I guess, international equities and sort of what's been happening globally uh, across the share market. So um, obviously these graphs are pointing upwards, which is a stark difference to the, the prior month, which is um, good news. But do you want to talk us through sort of some of the highlights here or sort of what you think of, um, people should be, I guess, taking out of last month? Yeah, look, it's, um, there's certainly very big, um, big numbers uh, for, for one month movements there. Uh, very strong recovery in, in Europe, the US um, and here in Australia. Um, not quite as high numbers in, in Asia, um, uh, particularly in, in China and Hong Kong, but we have to remember uh, the Chinese market was uh, not sold down anywhere near as heavily as uh, the other markets. So on a, a sort of three month basis, uh, China is still a, a big outperformer. Yeah. Um, the, I guess the other um, uh, thing to note with this chart is that a, uh, an 8, 10, 12% um, rally off the back of a 25% a, a correction, um, uh, we, we need to view it in that context. Um, so markets are still, uh, depending on which market you're looking at, sort of circa 20% below where they were uh, prior to the sell-off in um, in uh, late February. Um, but nonetheless, it, it, it's a, a fairly dramatic response that we had in April, uh, and certainly moving in the right direction from the investors' perspective. Yeah, and what what's clear from this is it's not 
you can't just treat global markets as one. It's you know, it's the same across every sort of uh, continent and country and sort of region. It's like the US, a lot of that tech sector. So the NASDAQ sort of rebounded quite strongly because I guess people are viewing that as maybe that's the future economy as well, where, you know, those digital businesses are perhaps not as subject to um, disruption as um, what those traditional businesses have been. So that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's like, and that means that sort of it might start to distort like things like the S&P 500 where, you know, uh, technology is taking up a bigger and bigger part, part of that pie as well. Yeah. So yeah. not as bad and, as uh, us and banking, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's getting up there. Yeah, that's, that's right. And that, that, that's one of the reasons why the Australian market didn't perform as well as the US market. Uh, it was largely based on the, the sector mix uh, yeah, in, yeah. in terms of the, the sectors that did better through April being IT, healthcare. Um, Australia has a relatively low allocation to those sectors. Yeah, well, we might talk, we might jump on, onto Australian equities now. They're a good segue, Brad. You've done this before. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Australian equities. Um, like here, I think some of those um, sectors you talked about have been really high performing, um, but probably to put it into context, as you mentioned, possibly not the biggest weightings uh, in the index. So that broader um, share market performance hasn't necessarily been as strong as the US in particular. Yeah, that, that you can see there with the, Australia's relatively small information technology sector was up over 20% for the month. Uh, on the healthcare side, probably more of that rally took place uh, in, in later in March. It um, was okay. it was fairly exhausted uh, by the time we got to got to April. Um, the other big sector there, from Australia's perspective, was energy, um, up twenty five percent in April. Uh, so we did get a, a, a bounce back in the oil price. Um, nonetheless, oil is still exceedingly cheap um, based on where it has been historically. Um, but there was certainly a bounce off the lows uh, in, in the month of April. Yeah, and then so in terms of what's happening a lot in the Australian market at the moment is a lot of capital raising. So I know we're getting, well, it's, it's lovely, uh, so it's good to be busy, but wow, they're just coming thick and fast at the moment. Um, so in terms of how you'd be suggesting people are approaching it or how you're seeing fund managers um, engage with this, is it, do you just brush in and take it all because it's sitting at a discount or um, do you need to sort of um, analyse these individually and see if they're actually the right fit for a portfolio? Yeah, look, certainly every every capital raise needs to be looked at individually. Um, I mean, the, the majority of capital raises are priced for success in, in, in the sense that um, uh, the company needs the capital. So they'll, they'll pitch the capital raise at a price where it's profitable at the time that they, they make the, the offer. Yeah. Um, so generally what happens is they raise the money in the institutional market uh, and then they provide retail investors with an opportunity to contribute capital as well so that they're not diluted through the process. Now, sometimes you get a, a movement in the price over that process, so it's not always necessarily profitable for retail investors to, um, to invest in a capital raise. Um, so that's why each, each uh, raise needs to be looked at individually. Um, I think the other thing that's important is to try and manage the exposure to each individual stock at the appropriate level. Mm -hmm. uh, because obviously, obviously, if you are contributing more capital to a stock, uh, your weighting in that stock goes up. Yeah. Uh, so then maybe you need to trim the position at the same time. Um, yeah. So you, uh, often it will be profitable to, to go into the capital raise, apply for the shares and also sell some shares on the secondary market. And hope you don't get scaled back. That's the, that's the unknown factor. So it's certainly not a perfect science in that you, you actually don't know how many shares you are going to get in most of these raises because of the, um, the ability for the, the company to scale back the, the allocation. Yeah, and that's a trick, isn't it? Because a lot of these are not like a, you know, one for X share. It's, a, you know, you can do 1,500, 3,000, know, 10,000, up to 30,000 in a lot of cases. So um, I think that portfolio positioning, that's a really good sort of... Uh, key take out there and um, from a banking sector perspective, are there key um, triggers that people should be looking at sort of, because that seems to be the one that um, is getting a lot of scrutiny and a lot of the mainstream media is really uh, zoning in on the banks and because yes, yeah, they've slushed dividends uh, in terms of from NAB's perspective, the other ones have sort of shelved it or you know, kicked it down the road a little bit. So. Is that is there are there key economic signposts that we should be looking to to um, have people feel comfortable about that that financial sector that looks like 
relatively it's underperformed. Yeah, look, and I think one of the reasons it has underperformed is because of the the expectation or um, concern that the banks may need to raise capital, um, as as NAB did. Um, ANZ and Westpac have taken a slightly different approach in that they've um, deferred dividends, um, which effectively bolsters their capital position. So I think there's been some holding off um, in buying the banks because of the unknown impact of, of those capital initiatives. Um, but what we have seen from the banks that have announced revised earnings is um, a, a relatively sharp increase in provisioning. So. Banks, I guess, are a little bit different to other companies in that um, they look forward to the environment ahead and provision for that environment. So the, the, they build the downturn into their current earnings that way, so, which is a little bit different to, a, say, a retailer where the, the downturn in profits actually occurs in the period of, of the economic downturn, whereas bank, banks are trying to preempt that in the way that they do their accounting. Um, so to some extent, we see we see the, the impact earlier in the financials in terms of their earnings, um, and that may provide some investors with a little bit more confidence in investing now that um, they've taken the hit to earnings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you if you are a long term investor, um, then That's the only type of investor we've got, Brad. Is, uh... Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the degree to which you should be concerned about dividends in six to twelve months time is is is, is arguably very limited. Uh, because you're investing for a much longer period. I think probably in terms of your question around what are the key signposts for the banks, so it, because they have taken the hit on the bad and doubtful debts, they are expecting a level of loan default, um, both in terms of the commercial lending and also the residential lending. So I think um, movements in property prices become a key uh, signpost. Yeah. Uh, uh, and if we do get through this, this cycle without too much damage being done to prices, then I think that will give investors quite a bit of confidence around the banking sector. Uh, because even if they do get loan defaults, the vast majority of their loans are backed by property um, as security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that may not ultimately lead to uh, losses to the same magnitude that they provision for. Um, interestingly, there, there isn't much in the way of uh, uh, signals at the moment that the residential cycle has turned down too hard. It's still, still relatively early days, but, um, the, the initial signals there is that the market's holding up reasonably well. Yeah, and that'd be good. Like if we can see sort of employment not fall off the cliff and people do return to work eventually, um, and then coming into that spring sort of um, property season, then hopefully we sort of see uh, something quite robust because that might mean the banks actually sort of have over provision and things aren't as bad as what they necessarily thought uh, going yeah. into it. So, um, Let, let's hope so. Yeah, um, but speaking of things that are lower for longer, <laughs> so um, fixed interest and currencies, we'll sort of, I've got another one here, the next slide sort of talking about the Aussie dollar versus the US, but do you want to talk to us about sort of how yields and sort of how people can invest in fixed interest at the moment or how those markets have played out? Because it just seems like they continue to sort of head lower. Um, yeah. Yeah, look, unfortunately, for fixed interest investors, um, there's not a lot, a lot of positive news there. Um, yeah, you've had um, cash rates being pushed down to very much close to zero in Australia at 0.25, uh, virtually zero in the US. Um, and you've also had bond yields fall further uh, through the, the period of the crisis. Um, you can see from the chart there, US bond yields have, have come down a long way and are now back below Australian 10-year bond yields. Um, so un unfortunately, with, with the 10-year yield down below 1%, um, there, there's very little prospect that um, uh, fixed interest investing uh, is going to yield much over the next few years. Um, uh, there's, I still believe, little scope that we'll see places like Australia and the US push yields into negative territory, which has happened in, um, at times in Europe and Japan. I, I think there is a... a a zero bound at the, at the lower end. So I think, don't think there's much more potential for these yields to go lower. Yeah. Um, uh, and there, there ultimately is potential for them to revert on the upside, uh, which would create capital loss for, for fixed interest investors. Yeah. So I think generally trying to maintain a relatively short duration position in fixed interest makes sense, but you're not, you're not going to get paid very much for that. Yeah, um, so it's, it's literally portfolio positioning and yeah, hopefully we, we, we sit and wait till things uh, start to look a little bit more uh, appealing from a yield perspective, but 
yeah, that's going to be the challenge and we might sort of address that in a, a separate sort of catch up, just sort of where you can get yield at the moment because um, a lot of the common places that everyone used to sort of just sort of bank on to get their yield, they've sort of disappeared and evaporated a little bit. That's right. Because yeah. I think we've, we're facing a new normal for the, uh, the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so do you want to talk to, about this? Because this is, um, depending on where you live, uh, where, <laughs> where you shop and what you purchase, this is a pretty um, yeah, uh, damning uh, graph in terms of the Aussie dollar versus the US. So how, are you feeling like this is, have we, have we got, seen the bottom of this or is it impossible to tell? Like how do you sort of uh, approach this from a, really sort of plays into global equities as well and how we sort of um, invest into global equities? Yeah, um, so the, the currency is always a, a, an interesting one. Um, from, a, from a longer term perspective, uh, I guess that there's the, the theory of purchasing power parity, which drives currency valuation. And um, effectively that theory suggests that you should be able to buy a basket of goods and services here in Australia um, at the same cost that you can buy that same basket in similar countries overseas like the US. Yeah. Um, uh, once you do the exchange rate um, transition. Um, the level which has that neutrality or, or parity is around US 70 cents. So that's where we see the fundamental value of the Australian dollar at about that level. And history has shown that on average, we do tend to trade around that level um, as an average. We don't necessarily spend a lot of time at that level. Uh, you can see we, we, we whipsaw around it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so generally in periods where you are below that level, um, I think you would assume that the probability of appreciation over time to take you back somewhere around that level is, is higher than the probability of moving further away from it. Um, so at the moment with uh, the dollar around that 65 cent level, you could argue that there is some upside potential there. Yeah. Um, I, I think that upside potential in the shorter term is also being driven by Australia has quite strong trade accounts at the moment. Um, uh, the numbers that have come through on our, our exports have been quite positive. China being one of the, um, the first economies to normalise, I guess, coming through this crisis uh, is, is looking relatively healthy. Um, so from a trade account perspective, that, that may be a source of support for the, for the currency. The other one is interest rates. So we saw on the previous slide that US interest rates had fallen back below Australian interest rates. So um, there, there is some incentive to hold Australian government bonds relative to US government bonds. So that also may drive some upside to the, uh, to the Australian dollar. So um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we, if we saw some shorter term rally in the Australian dollar. Okay. Um, from a portfolio perspective though, it's still, um, it's still maybe relevant to have some of your global equity exposure held on an unhedged basis yeah. simply because periods when equities fall tend to coincide with a falling dollar. Okay. So having, having some exposure hedged and some exposure unhedged may, may continue to make sense from a portfolio construction perspective. Yeah. And I think investors need to think long term, like we're not here to speculate on, you know, what's going to happen month to month. You're really trying to make, long ranging sort of assumptions. And that's where that, 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 pa that parity level, where that purchasing power parity, that sort of is what we need to focus on and look at probabilities and not try and think of what's gonna happen sort of uh, month to month necessarily. So That's right. Um, so like what's next? So I guess a, as a quick run through, obviously that was a really good snapshot of what's happened. Um, I guess looking forward, how do we go about positioning portfolios or what should we be thinking about uh, when it comes to sort of a, you know, a really sort of well diversified portfolio, which is sort of how we um, you know, encourage our clients to think about their investments. Yeah, look, I think because this, this is so unprecedented, um, what we've been through, it is very hard to have uh, any degree of certainty over how, how things will play out economically. Uh, and therefore how financial markets will react. Um, and I, I think that has to be acknowledged um, that the level of uncertainty is, is very heightened still at the moment, despite the, the improvement that we've seen over the last month. Um, so it, it is, it is a, 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 in that sense, a riskier period than normal uh, to, to be an investor. Um, nonetheless, in, in terms of where share markets are valued at the moment, I think um, there, there was evidence that there was um, overshooting or overselling in, in March. But I think where they've been brought back to is, is, is an appropriate level. I don't think they, 
uh, they're either cheap or expensive at this at this level. Uh, that wild movement is almost like that's that's traditionally that that human emotion of people overreact to bad news and then sort of it, it reverts because people sort of then quickly respond and go actually we've overreacted and try and overcorrect almost. So I think sort of just be cautious because I know a few yeah in the mainstream media it's sort of you know typed up like people always trying to pick the bottom and if you listen to those um, finance channels often enough someone's picking the bottom or the top uh, every every hour of every day so that's right uh, just yeah. be careful about what you're consuming and focus on the long term i think is important yeah that's right and and, and don't be overconfident in, in your ability to predict um uh because uh, particularly at this point in time uh there's very little basis on on, on, on to make those predictions but I think given, given where we're at from a valuation perspective, sticking to the long-term allocations makes sense yeah. uh, because it's very hard to have conviction um, either way outside of what your natural long-term exposure should be. I, I do think the, I guess the pendulum of attractiveness towards Australia uh, has probably improved relative to, to overseas economies, um, partly because of the way we've managed the virus, but also I think because of our position around uh the, the trade situation that we have with, with china um the fact that we haven't closed down a lot of our industries um that have been closed down in places like uh, europe uh so i think that there, there is some hope that we may bounce out of this a lot faster than other economies uh and we may actually be, be seen by international investors as a bit of a bit of a safe haven um you've got to remember too um the us is now entering its election cycle um, which puts a bit, bit of an added risk premium on the, on that uh, economy. Uh, so I think in terms of relative positioning, uh, Australia doesn't look too bad from, a, from an investor's perspective. Good. And then, yeah. so, and then it's just that diversification. I think fixed interest, even though the yield's not necessarily there, I think it still forms part of that, that foundation of a portfolio. So I think, do you, are you sort of encouraging investors that perhaps look beyond the, the sticker yield price and maybe look at those floating rate or some sort of short duration um, to manage the, you know, the frustrations that they're going to naturally be feeling in that space. Yeah, that's right. And, and look, the, the, the one thing the, the crisis has done, it has, has returned a little bit of value to, to credit. So in that high quality credit spectrum, mm -hmm. so the corporate debt securities, uh, the margins have widened um, and does, does provide some prospect for, um, some premiums over cash um, with, with the right managers in that part of the portfolio. But essentially, I think you should also, also look at the, the cash and fixed interest part of the portfolio, not, not only as a return seeking part of the portfolio, but it's actually there to, to uh, manage risk. Um, yeah, yeah. So depending on what, what, a, what your risk profile is, you, you need a certain amount of assets which are lower risk. Um, it's just unfortunate in this phase, you're not getting paid a lot on holding those lower risk assets, but you still need to hold them in order to meet the, the risk profile. Yeah. I think we're seeing a few more where it's sort of using, you know, people are using turn deposits and cash, like high interest savings accounts a little bit more because the disparity between the, you know, what you're yielding from your fixed interest, if you are keeping it high quality and a turn deposit or a high interest saver is not that different. So yeah, um, and, yeah, I yeah. think very, very, very important. Don't sort of, uh, don't not hold defensive assets because they're not yielding a hell of a lot now. So that's be right. disciplined. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, well, um, that's brilliant, Brad. So I really appreciate your time with that. Um, were there any other parting remarks you want to sort of leave investors with or? Um... Uh, look, yeah, um, I, I would just say um, be, be cautious, um, but uh, this, this sort of environment does throw up opportunities. So um, I, I, I think the uh, the temptation to take everything out of the market uh, can be strong in periods like this, but um, history shows that um, uh, the investing through these periods can actually be quite quite rewarding yeah. uh, if, if it's done in a, in a sensible manner. Yeah, absolutely. I think that if you can be disciplined, um, yeah, we've seen it before. This is not the first time we've had uh, a market sell off. So I think if you can be disciplined, don't be greedy, uh, I think would be the other thing, because I think we had a few people wanting to rush in and that was sort of, there was a groundswell of, is this the time to be plowing in? And if, if Warren Buffett's not plowing in, I think that might be a little bit of a signal to just sort of keep your level head about it. Um, but yeah, really do appreciate your time and your insights. Uh, I'm sure there's some real gold in there for people to, to walk away with. So I'll let you get back to your day, Brad. Thanks for joining us. No, no problems. Thanks, Pete. See ya. See you later.